Our culture is going to be longing for something that's solid. Well, the Word of God is solid and it never changes. And the cultures will come and the cultures will go, but the Word of God will stand forever. What will bring balance back to our nation and the nations of the world? It is nothing more, nothing less than the eternal words of God. Well, I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts chapter 1. And we're going to begin a journey through the entire book of Acts. And we're going to hit all of the subjects that are the hot buttons. We're going to talk about tongues, what it is and what it's not. We're going to talk about how the church is set up, what worship should be like, what we're going to face are the current issues of our day that are splitting churches to the four winds. And God doesn't like it. The Bible is the final authority to which we appeal in every aspect of life. Every one of us have a final authority to which we appeal. For some, it is what their church or their denomination is. For others, it's what mom or dad said. For someone else, it's what a pastor or rabbi says. For some, it would be what a, a commentary would say or what they learned at seminary or at college. For the child of God, the final authority is the Bible. God's eternal word. And so we're going to let that be our final authority to which we appeal in every aspect, even in the controversial things. And just like in the Old Testament as in the New Testament, good people disagree, great people disagree. But that doesn't mean that we become haters and we get ugly. We've lost the art of substantive debate in our culture. And we need to start that back within the church of Jesus. We need to love one another, care for one another, and aid one another, and be patient with one another in teaching. And so we're going to start out in the book of Acts, and then we're going to set down some basic principles as to how we're going to follow through in the book of Acts. It is very easy to outline, and we're going to do that in the coming weeks. But let's begin in the first verse of the first chapter. Luke, the author, wrote the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up out of their sight, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Again, the former account have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote it to a servant probably within the household of Caesar. His name was Theophilus. That means a lover of God. But more than likely, he was not talking to all lovers of God, even though there is application to what he says in the narrative. But what he is doing is talking to a disciple. And the other gospels were already written, all except the gospel of John. So he took eyewitnesses and those who had walked with Jesus, and he wrote down a reasonable account, an analytical account, to help people to understand who Jesus is. And as you read through it, he writes as a physician. That's why in Luke chapter 2, you have the birth details of the Messiah, Jesus. When he comes to this account, this sequel to the prequel uh, that is called Luke, the scripture says he was writing to give an account of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now that's an amazing statement. Now what that clearly says is that the work of Jesus is not finished. It goes on in the church of Jesus, now endued and empowered with the Holy Spirit. But at this time, it was just the beginning. The church had not been formed. Jesus is about to ascend to heaven. He's now risen from the dead. He's paid the full penalty for sin. When the Bible says that Jesus began to do and teach, 
It does not mean that he did not pay the sin debt. The fact is, when Jesus died on the cross, man's sin debt was paid. And anyone who will come to him, Jesus will forgive. And their sin is paid for, all that they've ever done, all that they'll ever do. But the work of God continues on through his people, through the Talmudim, through the disciples. And so as we look into the scripture, we're going to see that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the church of Jesus fulfills the work of Jesus until he returns. And so who are these people? Who are the main characters in the book of Acts? Well, I want to point out two or three. First of all, Jesus himself. When we go back to the Gospels in a few minutes, we're going to really learn about who Jesus is and the closing events of his life and his time on earth because it is there where the impetus comes from to continue the work of Jesus. Because Jesus, unlike many religious figures down through history, is not in a place where you can go and find him in a tomb or a grave. Jesus the Messiah is alive. He's alive then, he's alive now, he's alive forevermore. And so the Bible lays out the trek of the early church. And it's amazing that when we look at what the actual account is, that for the first eight to 10 years, there was not one Gentile, one non-Jew in the church. They were all Jews. That's why the Bible, I say, is a Jewish book written by Jews, to Jews, primarily for Jews. And if we're going to understand it, we're going to have to understand it in a Jewish context. And so that's what we're going to do. Now, some of the things I'm going to say in the coming weeks will fly in the face of what you've been taught in recent years especially. So I just want you to search the Scriptures. Be like the Berean Christians that we'll learn about later in the book of Acts that continually search the Scriptures to see if what the Apostle Paul was saying was actually so. And so let's look at the main characters. The first one is Jesus, obviously. We find Jesus in this first chapter of the book of Acts. He's on the Mount of Olives. For 40 days, he has been teaching them about the kingdom of heaven about the kingdom of God, about the kingdom that is coming. Now make no mistake, there is a spiritual aspect of the kingdom. That is the rule of God within the life of every believer. But that does not do away with the promises of God's restoration of Israel. Every promise that God made to Israel, God will fulfill. And he promised that he would come, set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, and he would reign. That's called the Messianic era. Now, in the evangelical world, we call that the millennial kingdom because of Revelation chapter 20, where it says over and over and over again that it will last for a thousand years. So it's called a millennium and the millennial reign. But ever how you name it, the reality is the same. Jesus is coming one day, the Messiah is coming back, and he is going to set up his reign from Jerusalem. This is what the conversation was about in Acts chapter 1. As a matter of fact, it says in verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded that they not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. You see, when Jesus talked to them about the kingdom, he basically said, I am going away, but I will come back. And over and over again in the epistles, the letters that flesh out what we call the Berit Hadashah or the New Testament, over and over again, the details are given, and especially to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos where he was uh, being persecuted, sent out there to die in exile. But if you look at verse 3, it says that he was showing himself alive, that he was giving irrefutable, infallible proofs that indeed he was the Messiah and that he was going to come and he was going to rule. That's what he says he was talking about. It says being seen by them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 
Now, if the, Jesus was not going to set up his kingdom, if Messiah was not going to rule on earth one day, this would have been a wonderful time for him to say, there's not going to be a kingdom, it's all spiritual. Again, there are spiritual aspects to the kingdom, God ruling within the life of every believer. But the reality is, if the Bible is true and it's our final authority and we don't allegorize everything, then the Messiah is going to rule on earth. He's going to set up his kingdom on earth. And those of us who are children of God will rule with him. That's what the Bible says. And so, as you read this, you will see that there they are on the Mount of Olives, according to the prophet Zechariah chapter 14, at the close of a great period of persecution that Jesus called the great tribulation, the great crushing, Messiah will come back, his feet will step down on the Mount of Olives, and he will set up his rule from Jerusalem. And all the nations will come, and all of the nations will bow down, and all of the nations will confess that he is indeed Messiah. And so here they are at the place where Messiah is going to return, where he's going to come. For 40 days, he's been talking to them about the kingdom and what that was going to entail. And so it's just very natural for them to ask, as they did in verse 6, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, after his resurrection and, and before his ascension, these disciples still believed that the kingdom was going to be restored to Israel, the Davidic kingdom, and indeed it will be. And so Jesus is setting them up for what is going to come and for them to continue the work that he's done. Who are the other main characters? Well, obviously it would be Peter. I want you to understand that when we talk about Jesus and we talk about Peter and we talk about John and we talk about Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, we are talking about people who are religious people. Now, I know over and over again over the last decades, we've been taught that Jesus was not a religious person. We've been taught that the disciples were not religious. No one says that Saul of Tarsus was not religious, but they say Peter was not religious. John was not religious. Jesus was not religious. I beg to differ with you. That's just not what the Scripture teaches. Jesus was very religious. As a matter of fact, he not only did everything that Torah, not the law, Torah doesn't mean law, it means instruction. Everything that Torah said, but he also did some things that were purely traditional. We want to throw tradition out the window. And listen, some traditions we need to throw out the window. But we cannot throw out the baby with the bathwater. All traditions are not bad. Some traditions are good. Jesus embraced some traditions. Others, he shunned. So we'll learn how to do that. How, which ones, according to the Bible, do we need to embrace? Which ones do we need to shun or, or discard? Because all tradition's not bad, all religion's not bad. The word religion, really people argue and debate about the, what it really means. But whatever you believe is a source, whether it is what Cicero said, that, that it is the doing of something, the thinking of something over and over again, re-lego, whether it is considering something over and over again, and by doing that, you get into a pattern of doing things, whether it is devotion to something, whatever your origins are of the word religion, it has to do with rituals that over and over and over and over again we do. That's why when someone goes to the gym or they mow their yard or they do something a certain way, we often say they do that religiously. Why? Because it is a routine. All routines and rituals are not bad. For instance, the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 4, we see he was religious and he did things that were not Levitical, not Old Testament, not Torah, but they were helpful for him. And in Luke chapter 4, the Bible says, beginning with somewhere around Luke 4, 15, it says, after Jesus came out of the wilderness... 
being filled with the Holy Spirit, having been tempted for 40 days, he came into the Galilee, into his hometown of Nazareth, and it was Shabbat. It was the seventh day. And as was his custom, he went in to the Beit Knesset, to the synagogue. Now, where on earth do you see synagogue or Beit Knesset in the Older Testament, in the Law of the Prophets and the Writings? You will not because it is not there. The Jews had a central place of worship called the temple. When that was destroyed in 586 B.C., by the Neo-Babylonians led by Nebuchadnezzar. The people were without a worship center and they were carried off, hauled off into Babylon, into the Mesopotamia Valley. And they had no way to stay together. And so in every community, they began to gather together and, and assemble themselves. The word, the Hebrew word for assemble or assembly is Knesset. That's why the parliament building in Jerusalem is called the Knesset. Beit or Beth is the word for house. And so they started gathering together in houses of assembly. Then when they gathered together, they would would talk about relatives. They would talk about life. They would talk about customs. They would talk about the law. They would talk about uh, all of the law, the prophets, and the writings that that were passed down from generation to generation because they did not want to lose that. And so it began to be a formal system of gathering together. By the time of Alexander the Great, when he brought in his language that became the lingua franca of the day, the common language of the day, outside of of just the, the Jews themselves, those houses began to be called synagogas brought into our language synagogues. But that happened during the intertestamental period. That happened during uh, what we would call the silent years. And I want to remind you that when we think of silence and God not speaking openly as he did not for 400 years, don't ever take God's silence for inactivity. He was preparing the way for the Messiah. And one of those was that he was putting preaching points all over the Greco-Roman world, because one day a rabbi that I'll talk about in just a moment would travel the Roman roads under the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, and he would preach the gospel of Jesus around the world, beginning first with the Jews in the synagogues. But Jesus went into a synagogue which was mere tradition. Never was it commanded that you worship in a synagogue. But yet Jesus did that. That was pure tradition. Why did he do that? Because it enhanced and encouraged his walk. It was there that that he was able to meet people and talk with people and to relish in the heritage that God had given him. Because Jesus was a Jew. And he followed Jewish traditions as long as they did not contradict the word of God. And that should be the decision maker in our life when it comes to tradition. And so Jesus was religious, and I can over and over again um, prove that to you by him observing the the festivals and the feast and the holy days and and, uh, reading the the readings of all of the Jews that they do uh, every week uh, from, from Torah and from... Uh, the uh, prophets and from the writings. But what about Peter? People say, well, we'll give you Jesus, but not Peter. Peter was an awful man. Peter was a religious man. You say, wait just a minute. How do you know that? Well, because the Bible, which is our final authority, tells us that. Gives us insights into it. Do you remember in Acts chapter 10 what happened? Peter, after Pentecost, was at Lydda which is where the Ben-Gurion airport is today in Lod. And he went from there after his encounter with Dorcas over to the coast to Jaffa, to Joppa. And there he stayed with a man by the name of Simon the Tanner who lived down near the sea where he had plenty of water. And as you'll recall, God had spoken to a man 
uh, a couple of days' journey up the Sharon Valley in Caesarea Maritime. His name was Cornelius. He was a Roman centurion, well-respected, a God-fearer, someone who was seeking after God. And the Bible says that Peter was up on the roof and that he began to have a vision. And what he saw was a sheet coming down, and in it was all kinds of animals, clean and unclean. There were creeping things. Uh, there were things that were unlawful for any Jew to eat. And a voice said, Peter, rise and eat. And do you remember what Peter said? He said, no, I cannot. It's unclean. It's not kashrut. It's not kosher. And God said, what I have made, what God has made, you are not to call unclean. Rise and eat. And Peter said, I cannot do that for since my youth, I have not done it. What does that mean? Since he was a boy growing up, his family was religious and he was kosher. Non-religious Jews are not keeping kosher. You have to be somewhat of an observant Jew to keep kosher rules. And that's exactly what Peter was. Peter was a religious Jew. But just like in every other religion, there are, that doesn't mean that they're perfect and never will be. But his way of life, his, his manner of life was religious. You say, well, what about John? John, according to his own writings, you can turn back there, and it would be good for you to do that. Turn back to the Gospel of John for just a moment. I want to show you just what the Bible itself says uh, about John. Turn to chapter 18 uh, in the New Testament. Turn back just a, uh, a book, and you will find in the 18th chapter of John a clue that lets us know that John was religious. The sons of Zebedee and the family of Zebedee were religious because it says that when Jesus was betrayed and he was taken to the house of Caiaphas, that Peter trailed along beside, but it says in verse 15, and Simon Peter followed Jesus. This is from the Garden of Gethsemane after his arrest. And also another disciple. Now that disciple, and we know that was John. Now that disciple was known to the high priest. Whoa, wait a minute. John was known to the high priest? How would he have been known unless he had been around the high priest a whole lot? Non-religious people were not around the high priest a, a, a whole lot. And it said it was known to him and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Look at this. It goes on. But Peter stood in the door outside. Look at this. Then the other disciple, this same disciple, who was known to the high priest, it says it again, went out and spoke, this means he had influence, they knew who he was, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. No one who was non-religious who did not know the high priest would have had that kind of pull, as we call it, to get a man in to a person that is likely going to be crucified soon. What I'm telling you is, this was a marker again, of a religious person. Shall we talk about Saul of Tarsus? Saul of Tarsus studied under the feet of Gamaliel. There has not been, since Gamaliel, there has not been anyone else to take his place. Gamaliel even appears in the book of Acts, chapter 5. He was the one that was conciliatory toward the apostles who was just like his teacher, Hillel. Hillel and Shammai were two of the greatest rabbis of that era. And Hillel had a prize student. His name was Gamaliel, and that is the Gamaliel we're talking about. Now, why is that important? Because the prize student of Gamaliel was a man from Tarsus named Saul, the one who lived in Tarsus, who originated from Tarsus. And he is the one that had the Damascus Road experience in chapter 9 where Jesus the Messiah, risen from the dead, changed this religious man forever who had all the credentials and made him the greatest 
proponent of the gospel in the New Testament era. You see, religion is good, but religion will not take you to heaven. Only Jesus will take you to heaven. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for watching Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp. We hope that the Spirit of God has touched you through Tony's message and that your knowledge of the Bible continues to grow. As you study the truth of the Bible and you feel you do not fully understand what it means to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we would like to help you. Contact us today at TonyChrisp.org and we will send you this free booklet, How to Know God in a Personal Way. This resource will help answer your questions about how you can begin your journey as a follower of Jesus. Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp is made possible because of your prayers and generous financial support. If you feel God is leading you to contribute to this ministry, you can easily give online at TonyCrisp.org donate. Or you can send your gift to P.O. Box 6596, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37914. A gift in any amount is appreciated. No gift is too small, and there's no gift too large that can be used to God's highest purpose. Thank you. As Christians grow in knowledge about the Bible, we often try to visualize its history. Most of us wonder what it would be like to be in the places mentioned in the scriptures. That dream is made a reality for hundreds of people each year through TLC Holy Land Tours. For more than 40 years, Dr. Tony Crisp has led thousands of church leaders and pastors on life-changing spiritual journeys to the land where the history of the Bible comes alive. Join Tony on a trip to the Holy Land. You will be in awe as you visit places where the prophets of the Old Testament carried out God's commands. Experience the reverence as you stand on the ground where Jesus stood, sail on the waters where He walked, and hear teaching in places where our Lord spoke. Your experience in the Holy Land will add a new dimension to your understanding of the Scriptures. You will never read the Bible the same way again. You can start your journey today and explore your touring options at tlcholylandtours.com. That's tlcholylandtours.com. I want to invite you to join me each weekday for the podcast On the Way with Dr. Tony Crisp. Monday through Thursday, we explore biblical passages, people, places, and prophecies. Each Friday, I answer questions from listeners. If you have a biblical question you would like answered, please email us today at questions at TonyCrisp.org. That's questions at TonyCrisp.org. You can find these podcasts on every major platform, but you can get started immediately by going to podcast. .tonycrisp.org. That's podcast.tonycrisp.org. Listen and then choose whatever service you would like to use. These podcasts are 7 to 15 minutes long and will help you to get your day started right and will encourage you and your family as you walk with God and enjoy your journey.